my like a uh, little intro is for like those of you um, who maybe uh, don't, don't know Dan very well. I'm not going to do like a you know a monumental introduction to Dan. Um, um, I'm just saying, I just want to say to word how this came around because I think it's very nice to see who, I mean, I contacted Dan and now magically there are so many other like interesting people that I, I admire on the call and that, that is like the magic of inviting Dan, right? So uh, it all started during a walk. I was listening to a podcast where Dan uh, was in the podcast. It's a co-recursive, so maybe you might be interested in uh, like a link, like uh, uh, downloading those podcasts because they are quite good. And Dan was talking um, about like the little typer book. He was introducing the the book, and um, there th that is when I I was like thinking about potential people to invite to the to the conference. Uh, and uh, the idea was how who can I invite to give like a, a broader view or a different perspective on uh, uh, like uh, uh, the lispiness that we are all used uh, uh, in Clojure uh, when we program in Clojure. And uh, the reason why I invited Dan was because of his like uh, way far, way off perspective on things in the sense of uh, uh, like being able to go back to the roots of our language and understand uh, the basics and the roots of uh, uh, a few of the features that we are uh, using every day in, in Clojure. And uh, uh, then I thought, um, how can I transmit this to like the Clojure community or the, the, like the small uh, community of people that are in this call today and uh, on YouTube? And uh, I thought maybe we should uh, uh, answer, like we should ask uh, uh, Dan a few questions and uh, have him answer uh, these questions uh, regarding interesting concepts in the functional programming and uh, uh, like aspects of his research and how he came uh, about like about uh, uh, he came about like uh, uh, studying and uh, uh, inventing a few of those things that now they are like so uh, uh, they are like implemented multiple times in different languages um, or those ideas at least are uh, the seed of the implementation of many modern features in modern languages. Um, so th that is about it. Um, uh, so uh, in, in, the, in terms of, of, of closure, uh, a couple of things I want to mention that they are going to introduce then the, the, the official question I'm going to ask Dan first uh, are uh, things like um, uh, laziness and uh, the way we, uh, we can use infinite sequences in closure. Um, has this deep root going back to some of the work that Dan did uh, in the 70s. And uh, I hope he, he can like, talk a little bit about that as well. And uh, things like uh, uh, logic programming with core logic, uh, a library that didn't make it into closure standard and into the closure standard library, uh, but uh, like deeply inspired the closure community in other ways, such as uh, uh, data log and data log uh, make it uh, made it into um, uh, crux, for example, or datomic. So other products that uh, products that we're used to are inspired by some of the working relational programming by Dan and Will. Um, uh, and uh, I'm also interested in like knowing how these things came around and how how it comes that we get to know them today. Um, so. I'm going to start with the with the first question, but the idea is, I have a few of them. Uh, some of them came from the audience. Some of, some of them will came from will come from the audience. Um, I'm pretty sure will be will diverge, and I don't want to follow the questions I have here. If I have to, I will, but I'm pretty sure will diverge in very interesting ways. Uh, in any case, so I was saying that I found uh, fascinating the story of uh, uh, like uh, the build up of uh, cons should not evaluate its arguments, which is the title of a paper uh, that Dan uh, uh, wrote in uh, 1976. And uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by that story, that story because it's essentially the story of uh, uh, like uh, discovering something simple um, and at the same time strange, like uh, 
why one should go about experimenting uh, like uh, creating infinite sequences and find something useful out of them. And it turned out that there are many things you can do when you do that. So I just wanted to start with uh, like asking Dan, uh, like how that idea came about and uh, how it is that it, get, it got developed in so many interesting ways. Well, if I can, before I answer your question, um, I want to thank the Closure community for the way it welcomed uh, Will Bird and I, basically giving us a giant hug when we went to the second, I think it was the second um, uh, Closure Conj in Raleigh. And I also want to mention that um, the stuff that's been coming out in terms of relational programming had a huge boost from a question by Stuart Holloway following our uh, surprise talk <laughs> for, uh, when we showed up at um, that, that Raleigh meeting. And also, uh, I want to thank, uh, I want to mention David Nolan, who built the, uh, the system that we had developed. Um, it was amazing. So I'm really happy to be visiting the closure world again. So thank you very much for your invitation. Now, as to your question, this is a book that maybe most of you have never seen. Now, just tell me when you can read it or if it's or not. Can you read the title? Uh, well, the big white title, yes. And then it's, uh, oh, it's, it's in French. Sous la direction de Robinet. Yep. Uh, yeah, well, programmation okay. is so, definitely there. Yes, <laughs> so somewhere in this book, and I'm not gonna go to the page because it's too much like work. But there's a paper that I wrote with David Wise that appeared in 1976. Okay, and I'm gonna describe that and then you'll get the idea of where the whole thing came together. So the idea was very simple, incredibly simple. We, Lisp had an operator called map, and you gave it a function. And we decided, well, we want to be able to give it a bunch of functions. Now, and then for each of these functions, though, we gave it a list. And the problem was, when we ran when we ran this thing, so there's they're, they're not paired up like that, but you, you get the idea. F on these, F two on these, and so on. Now these guys eventually ran out of values. They weren't always starting out at the at the uh, smallest uh, at the largest size. So some of them were like this, and some of them were like that. Okay. Now we invented a rule so that we could manage that. And the rule was called the uh, guillotine rule. Okay, the guillotine rule said, ah, everybody else loses their head when you end up running out of values. So is there any issue about that? Is that pretty obvious to everyone? Okay, let's say it is, to hypothetically. So let's, let's motivate why we ended up with this. We wanted something like currying, and that tells you a little bit of how old it is. We wanted something like currying, so you could say lambda x map lambda x, um, uh, let's say um, plus x three, okay? So lambda x plus x3 will give you whatever you're giving and we're gonna give it a value of five. So that's, an, that's, that's standard, right? The whole answer is eight and everybody's happy. 
But the reality is I wanted this to be a bunch of fives, right? Because we're in a map. And then if we had a, a bunch of threes somewhere, maybe fewer, then when we applied this operator that we had, I think I still talked about this, by the way, in um, my 60th birthday party. Um, but in any event, when we do the map here, we're gonna have, we're gonna need to use the guillotine rule. One, two, three, four, five, and there's four here. So we have to use the guillotine rule. So the lists are gonna come back with that, but the operators plus. So we're gonna add, we're gonna end up with um, a bunch of eights, okay? Now, one day I was thinking to myself, wait a minute, why is it I can only do these with fives? I want to have bigger things than fives, finite number of fives, because I might have a, an infinite number of these lists or, or an infinite uh, ele number of elements in the list. But how am I going to get infinite numbers? Well, that's obvious how to do that. I want an infinite number of fives. I know how to get that. Instead of an empty list, we'll just point back to it. Now we have an infinite number of fives. Okay, so now we can have an infinite number of fives and an infinite number of fours. And eventually we will we'll know that somebody in here is going to run out of steam. Otherwise we're in a lot of trouble, but eventually we run out of steam and therefore we get a, some finite number of these things. As I said, the guillotine rule had a role. So you might just have a list like one, two, three here. So when we add them all up, we're gonna end up with, uh, well, you get the idea, right? It's pretty obvious at this point. This is 1974, it's, uh, we've learned a few tricks since then. So one day I was asking myself, well, heck, if I can have, an infinite list of all the same number, why can't I have something like an infinite list of the multiples of five? Five, 10, 15, and so on. Hmm, what am I gonna do? Well, as it turns out, Will and I, I'm sorry, David Wise and I, sorry, worked a long time with Will. Um, you're, you're revising history here, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> no, so, not many people know I actually invented scheme, uh, streams, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so this is what started it. That other relationship worked. And then um, we had been working on a, the result of, a, uh, of having gotten a grant proposal uh, in fact, that grant, the two grant proposals came at the same time with both Mitch and David. Um, so we, we were in business at that point. And then, so David and I were working on it. And our goal was to turn the processing of a pen to be um, imperative. Just take the definition, the recursive definition, and try to turn it into an imperative one. In other words, we wanted to use probe. But the reality was that in order to do that, we were building this thing up just a little bit at a time, going left to right on the, on the append. It wasn't far, wasn't long, till we submitted conscientious, that we came up with conscientious evaluated arguments. What many people probably don't know, however, is the title of our submission to the ICAL paper was uh, on constructors, uh, the algebra of constructors. So we changed the title because we'd figure this thing out. And by the way, David came up with the uh, memoizing idea. He said, you know what we can do? We can just put something in there, and then when the time, when we evaluate it, we can just plop in something into the car or the coder, wherever it came from. So David, David came up with that. It was really cool. I said, oh my God, that's brilliant. 
So anyway, um, I to, let, me, let me just take a little moment here. Um, so we were, we were rolling, we got the thing to work, and how did we get it to work? And this is the God's honest truth. We had this thing called the Silent 700. We put it, we put the code into the Silent 700, which was both silent and extraordinarily old, and it used that rolled paper. Remember the rolled paper? And some, some of you do, I know you do. Um, and then we took that and ran it. Now it was, it was lazy and we knew it was lazy, but we didn't know it was going to be lazy. And we're looking at the screen and a parenthesis comes out, came out about like that, just a little tiny bit of a parenthesis. And we're looking at each other like, oh darn, what happened? And then something else came out. And I have to tell you, that was one of the most exciting things I had ever felt. When some little other piece of information came out, I think we were doing like, I don't know, point-wise addition of two lists. And then it came out and I couldn't believe it. I absolutely could not believe it. And then it just floated along and then terminated. David looked at, uh, at me and I looked at him and he said, wow. In any event, um, when, when it was all over, we changed it, we made a new title and we called it, well, we, once we figured this out, we called the title um, Cons the Magnificent. But that's not the title of the paper. <laughs> So one of us, and I won't say who, because it wasn't me, um, came up with, let's call it something more academic. And I said, well, David, you're, sure, let's do it. So it became, um, Khan should not evaluate its arguments. And it was, it was great. It was a wonderful thing. And I will say one other item about it, which is, um, David and I went to the, well, first David had this brilliant idea to send a copy to uh, James H. Morris and Peter Henderson. Uh, I, don't, I don't know where Peter was, but I know that James H. was in um, uh, at Xerox Park at the time. So we sent it to him because they had a, um, a popple paper in January. Our ICAL paper came out, I think it was in July. Um, but David sent it ahead of time because I thought that um, they should know that, that we have basically had the similar result to their lazy evaluator paper in the second pop And we walk into the room and people are walking up to David and me and saying, Khan should not evaluate its arguments. It was a really great and emotionally uh, wonderful experience. And then it turned out that James H. Morris spent most of the time during his talk on the Lazy Evaluator explaining what we had done. And thank you, James. Okay, did you have another question um, or no? Do you want me to just um, keep on going? <laughs> just uh, keep rolling just, along? Well, I always want to invite uh, the audience um, to like feel free to raise their hands or like send them like a message to the channel and. Uh, when you like stop and uh, ask for conversation, we'll relay maybe a couple of additional questions. So um, I don't see them at the moment, but as soon as I do, I'll. I'll, I'll I, I just say one that question. says from Will Bird to everyone. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Bill. Will. Uh, well, so, since uh, given given who is in this call, I thought uh, this would be a good time for a question. Dan, how did you learn about Scheme? Well, in 1975, there was this remarkable little paper that Mitch Wan handed to me sometime in January, I think, of 1975, uh, 76. He took it out of a satchel this big. I can't know if you can tell how big that is. And said, and he's going through all the papers he brought home from MIT, which is where he got his PhD, and he comes up to this paper and he says, Dan, I think you'll like this. The understatement 
of my life. Now, what you, what Mish didn't know at the time that I had spent a whole hunk of time in uh, CDC Lisp, and I was, I was getting pretty good at it, but I didn't like it. It was didn't have features that I thought should be there, and I didn't know what those features were. I know that sounds strange, but it's true. And I kept getting sort of upset that things weren't doing what I wanted them to do. Uh, the Lisp Lambda at the time had derived itself from the blue and white book, but decided they were smarter than McCarthy, et cetera. And they weren't because they destroyed the evaluator with what they thought was cleverness. And the evaluator was itself the most clever thing ever. It had proper closures. Isn't that right, Jerry? Jerry? No? OK. But it had proper I closures. I don't remember. It does. <laughs> Trust me. I actually ran the interpreter when I was at the University of Texas. And uh, I put a trace in a member of like three elements in a list. And it came back. Again, this I can't tell you, but it's approximately an inch and a half of pages. Mm -hmm. And it had an error at the very back of it that said unbound variable T or F. I guess it was F. Um, uh, no, nil. It was unbound variable nil. And it was very interesting because 30 seconds later, I was running it again. Of course, it's overnight because those were the days when you got to compute overnight. And, but I knew it would work because I just set up the initial environment with T begets T and um, nil gets nil. I'm pretty sure there were quotes on the second arguments, but I'm not positive. In any event, there's this statement in there that says, um, whenever you see a, a capitalized word, that means it's quoted. This is an M, M expression list. That means it's quoted. So I didn't know that and I didn't read it carefully enough. Typical, typical way I read. And I spent a lot of money on paper. <laughs> I didn't spend it. I just got a, a little bit of a lecture on um, wasting paper. And these are those big giant pages. You remember how those looked as well, I'm sure. Most of you do. Okay, so um, I think that's a, a good start. So uh, where are we now? It is a good start. Um, so I'm gonna ask like another question. question. Yeah. I'm oh, oh wait, another. I forgot to tell you. So yeah, uh, Jerry's and Guy's paper did it correctly. And I said, oh, this is incredible. I can now do lambdas. I tried to do it in my implementation of Snowball 4 um, do, while I was at the LBJ School of Public Affairs, which means it was in my last two years of being a professor, I'm sorry, of being uh, at, at the University of Texas, and it didn't work. So when I got it from Mitch, I knew I was in seventh heaven, and I've been there ever since. Okay. So let me, let me start. Yeah, I'll start with another question and see where we go with this one. Okay. So you told me uh, that you never wrote like a line of closure. Uh, Not a word. Language. Yeah, no. that's fine. Uh, but for that matter, like you never wrote like a line of prologue. You told no, me I never that. wrote a line of prologue either. Nonetheless. I have books on prologue. Yeah, not, ju not just written. that. Not that. Not just yeah. that, and nonetheless, you uh, implemented several like paths of different kinds of lisps or several paths of different kinds of prologues. And some of those prologues became then canon, mini canon, core logic, and so on. Yes, yes. So, yes. is it possible to write implementation of languages that you never write a, like a line of, except for Oh, lisp? I did it all the time. I, I've no, done it, possible. I've probably done it. 30 or 40 times. Um, every time I read a paper that was in, in CAC, I'll give you an example real quickly. 
uh, Jerome Feldman had a, a paper in CAC, um, anybody remember the, the uh, language name? It's not coming to me right now. In any event, it was all described in there beautifully. I said, well, let's just implement this, see, see what it does. So I implemented it in Lisp with the standard model that I always use, which is macros and functions and nothing else. And my macros, I think back then when, when Feldman's paper came out, but I'm not sure, but I think back then uh, it was, you know, conventional Lisp macros. Uh, but once I got my hands on uh, Eugene's great work on hygienic macros, um, it was like a non a non starter. It was just absolutely um, tri trivial to take any language and just translate it into it and run it. And I'm not talking about writing an interpreter for it. I love interpreters. Don't misunderstand. But um, it's much more intellectually satisfying for me to write a set of, a small set of macros and a uh, uh, um, and a handful of functions. In fact, I let me just tell you one little story. Um, Dick Keyberts had a, a language called Marigold. And Marigold um, was using sort of a, a stream-like thing. Um, and it had uh, a, a kind of a s other relationships in it. But he came to give a talk at IU. And when he spoke, um, he s described what he was doing. It was just a lot of years ago. And I, I said to him, uh, you're staying at the union, right? I, he said, yeah. I said, well, would you, if you'd like to come to my house, we can implement your language tonight. Oh, that'd be great. I've never done it. And sure enough, we finished it. We got it implemented. But I have to say that I didn't do it perfectly because I couldn't think that fast. But the, min the minute he left the house, well, actually, I took him back to the union, um, it hit me what to do. And that was, in order to print all these streams that were coming out at the same time, the only way that we could have done it would have been by using engines. Well, at that time, we had already developed with Chris Haynes this notion of engines. So engines are basically machines, like a car, that you fill with gas. So one of my little stories that I tell people is, well, when you have an engine, you can fill it with gas and you can drive all the way to Martinsville. And then you have two choices because you're a functional programmer. You can fill it up with gas again or you can get a new car and then fill it up with gas. So you can collect automobiles in that metaphor. Okay, and so what we said uh, back then was that we wanted to have uh, the ability to break up your computations into whatever size you want by designing a, a system that would give it to you. And that was a lot of fun. And there's a, there's a handful of papers and it's in Racket, engines are in Racket, and they're fun to play with. Uh, but I, I needed them, I needed them at the time. I didn't think of them at the time. And that would have allowed me to print exactly what he wanted for answers from all the streams that were coming out of Marigold. Okay, um, any other thoughts from anywhere? Let's see, I'll just wait a second to see if uh, anyone else wants to make a, a question. If not, I have a, a couple that came in by um, email. Okay. Um, so I'll do one first because now we, I'm, I'm going to like uh, move uh, slightly more into the future, like closer to where we are now. Uh, one is kind of a controversial question that I want to ask. And uh, well, maybe it's not controversial, but it's provocative at least. So in today's world of uh, corporate programming, um, we are mostly dominated by like imp the imperative, imperative languages or the imperative uh, paradigm. Some of us are lucky and they, can work functionally, or they can work maybe with uh, like uh, some good strain of object orientation, which is not easy to find. Um, so I wanted to ask you, why does it matter today to understand some of the concepts we are talking about uh, today here, such as recursion, 
infinite sequences, maybe suspensions, continuations. Why? Well, if you if you have, if you have to like give us a message of why these things are important, uh, what that would be? <laughs> okay. So in very simple terms, if you don't use, if you don't understand what you're doing, being told what you're doing is wrong makes no sense, okay? You have to have a start in thinking properly. And I remember when um, we decided in the scheme, um, committees that we're going to require uh, tail calls to be re to be necessarily the way you implement tail calls that have no stack basically okay um, and all of a sudden you have all the imperative tools if you need them by just making a recursive call now that merges with higher order functions continuations engines and a whole host of things that are sitting in racket and all of a sudden you have incredible powers not only that you have incredible powers with macros i mean what, what the, the, the racket community has added to macros is just extraordinary it's not that i don't i don't use them because i'm writing a little book generally speaking and when you're writing a little book you are not teaching something that, that complicated as the current state, but the power of them is extraordinary. So when you have enormous amounts of power, and then with all the stuff that's already in racket, you have an incredible powerful tool. And not to know and understand that is just foolishness as far as I'm concerned. Um, so when I think in terms of what goes on, I think to myself, it's a shame that these people don't realize that what they're doing is so much easier than what they're trying to do. That's my opinion. Anybody else have another one? I'm happy to hear it. Now, was, it, was that a two-part question? Am I missing that? Uh, no, I think it was a single-part question. Okay, uh, so I do want to go back to my statement about closure, closure and, and um, uh, I forgot what it was. Um, closure and, oh, and prologue, of course, of course, of course. So um, uh, Cynthia Brown was in the department and she said to me one day, you really ought to learn prologue. And I thought to myself, okay, I'll do that. I'll get a book and read it. Or, oh, there was an article in, uh, and Kakam, I'll read that. Well, I couldn't make any sense out of it because I always look for where, you know, where the, where's the lexical scope? Lexical scope to me is, 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 is the most magic thing that's out there. And it was gone, it wasn't there. And I said, oh, I'll get around to this someday. Well, someday came and I was able to take one other piece of information, which was I would, had been invited um, to a workshop in um, at, uh, Syracuse by uh, uh, Alan Robinson. And I didn't know why, but I decided I would go and I went. And he take, took me over for about three or four minutes, five minutes and said to me, you should be using streams in, um, in, in logic programming. And it, I was so overwhelmed by the, the fact that I was talking to John Robinson that everything he was saying was like in another space. And I couldn't hear a word of it. I don't know if you can appreciate that, but if you knew me, you'd understand it in a second. <laughs> but the reality is that I, it was quite a few years earlier when I went to Syracuse. And and there's a little funny story I'd like to tell you. I was uh, in a cab going from the airport to my hotel in Syracuse, and the radio was on, as people would do. Um, and I heard the phrase, 
well, we hit 100 today, again. And I thought, I looked outside. This was in February. <laughs> it wasn't the weather. <laughs> well, it was sort of the weather. They had reached 100 inches of snow that particular uh, day. In any event, uh, I didn't know anything about prologue at that time. I didn't know what he was talking about. And I said, well, someday I'm going to have that chance. And someday came and I decided I'm going to stop playing with logic languages as things that can do magic tricks, that uh, super magic tricks. And I will work really hard on building a logic system that is super fast. Of course, I fail. But it was very clean and very elegant. And then um, I put this out on my class website. And um, when Oleg, sorry, uh, Oleg Kisilyov found out that I had written a relatively fast, it wasn't fast, but it was designed to be fast um, system. I had written a, about 124 pages of notes um, basically that I wanted my students to read and Will actually was one of those <laughs> suffering people. <laughs> it wasn't well written. It was just getting all my ideas in one place. And so uh, Oleg wrote me an email and with about, I don't know, 35 pages of email when I printed it. And uh, it was um, quite a lot of information. So I got in touch with them, I emailed them back and then we started chatting not that kind of chatting, but you know, emailing back and forth. And uh, I said to him, you know, I'm not doing anything this summer. Um, you want to join me in this uh, quest, to come up with a really elegant and simple uh, logic system? And he said, sure. I said, okay. So next thing I know, we're on SourceForge. And he is writing programs that are from another planet based on my code, because he noticed that I was using the model where you have lists of values everywhere, um, and then uh, you're unifying those lists against other lists in a more relational style. But uh, what happened was that uh, I was explaining this to Will one day, and let's just say he gave me a facial disdain like I'd never seen before. What he didn't know was that I was thinking of redesigning uh, the whole system because I had been starting to think that I could get by without these lists running around. And it wasn't that the lists were bothering me. What was bothering me was the 30 plus lines of macro that Oleg had written. And to make it go fast because that made it go fast. And I said to myself, after Will had given me this, I'll just call it a facial disdain. I'm not going into details. And uh, I said, okay, tonight I'm gonna throw away everything that is not relevant. And that wasn't, that didn't take minutes. And then I came to campus and, and Will said, oh, let's call it Mini Canron. So Will actually named Mini Canron. And I loved the name. I thought it was a very great idea. We used it and I guess we're still using it. Um, so those relationships have worked out very nicely. But in point of fact, I just love having people around me to work with and somehow great things end up happening, you know, fascinating changes. And you know, you know about MediCan, I'm sure most of you, and that's doing really, really well these days. And if you go to uh, minicanron.org, you can see more things about what you can do with Mini Canron and or with closures, uh, with the David Nolan stuff. Um, have yourself a ball. Any other questions? Yeah, we have, yes. Yes, we, we have a wild raised hand, uh, probably go with that uh, because it's interactive. So Edward, if you want to make your question and then I'll go with uh, the chat. Uh, hi, I just wanted to start by uh, saying thank you for this uh, walk through the roots of uh, closure. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, 
And my question was more sort of about the future. So w one of the developments that we got out of Clojure was, be, uh, was the sort of sequence abstraction and being able to treat all collections uh, equally with map and filter and reduce and whatnot. Uh, oh, I love that stuff. It's beautiful yeah. stuff. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, it is really. Uh, and I, was I was actually at the uh, talk by, oh, help me. He's the one who started closure. <laughs> uh, Richicki, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, well, I was just uh, curious uh, what your thoughts on were, uh, what your thoughts were about uh, sort of what directions and developments uh, we could and should be making in terms of how we structure our languages. Uh, well, you certainly can't go wrong if you uh, look at the structures that are in, in Racket and in Haskell. There are, you know, there, there are whole category theory packages uh, in Haskell. Uh, there's just nothing you can go wrong with that. But let me just sort of back up a little bit and talk a little bit about my philosophy of writing programs. Now, you know that they have to be little, little tiny programs. Otherwise, they don't fit in little tiny boxes. And I encourage everyone to try to understand the power of those really small boxes. And in fact, uh, we maybe we'll get a chance to talk to Anurag uh, in the relatively near future. Um, and we'll, we'll say a little bit more about that. But I can't really, I can't, my attitude is basically map is complicated, okay? Because I wanna think, I wanna think about everything in the shower is the, the model I use. So if I'm writing a really complicated program, I want all the pieces in my head. I don't wanna go running to a, a, a manual. Thank you very much, uh, Jerry, for that. But um, I, I don't wanna do that. I want to think really hard about certain aspects of things. And if you can do that, then you can mess around a little bit more. But um, everyone who has ever worked with me know that if you don't make them really simple, you're going to leave out way too many people from the table. And I don't want to do that. They simply don't. OK. Um, I don't know how to answer your question, though, really. Yeah. Can we use this moment to uh, let me let me talk to uh, Anurag at this point? Sure. Is he uh, on? I, he's supposed to be. I am here. Yes. Hi, Anurag. Anurag is Hi. one of my uh, successful PhD students. Can I talk a little tiny bit about your little business? <laughs> Please. <laughs> okay. I, this is not planned, trust me. <laughs> um, I hate using that phrase anymore because it's lost a lot of credibility. <laughs> but um, the, the Anurag um, got his doctorate and then he um, had, a, uh, had a startup. I won't go into the details of that, but then he started another startup, there's others in between, but called Paper Culture which is a very cool thing. And you'll find that out when you go on the web page. That's all I'm going to say. Okay, now, um, I would like for Anurag to explain the one book that was in that little table, if you saw it, um, that hasn't been finished yet. So let go ahead, Anurag. Okay, um, the book that Dan is, is referring to uh, is called The Little Learner. Um, now, the, the title, you know, hints at whatever it hints at. But I sort of want to tie it back to what, what Dan was just saying about having programs that you can think about in the shower. <laughs> and, um, you know, I sort of a few years ago jumped into... Um, into machine learning and trying to understand sort of the the new wave of deep learning and what's going on with it. And I don't know if others of you have attempted this task, but that whole field is monstrous. It's like hitting a wall of concepts that um, 
are so abstract and the pedagogy around it is so weird that it is just, it's baffling how people even manage to, to understand what they're doing at the level that I think we understand how to work with programming languages. Um, so, uh, you know, I sort of obviously went through it and, you know, got deep into it. And then I meet up with Dan one day, we were at some event at IU. We were at a real event. <laughs> at a real event. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was visiting IU after many years and it was great to see Dan again and, you know, and I said to him, hey, I want to write a little book with you. And Dan said, yes, let's do it. And then he asks me, what is the book about? <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and then I explained to him how, this, how I felt that this whole field of um, uh, machine learning and deep learning in particular is just a gigantic mess. Uh, and it is sort of impossible for people to understand it at this raw intuitive level without putting years and years of work into it. Um, and so we decided that we were going to write a little book um, for about, for specifically for, you know, deep learning. Um, and yeah, we're, <laughs> we're in the middle of that. Um, the the challenge of fitting everything into little boxes, you know, the the equivalent of a five line program that sort of builds it up, uh, you know, one function at a time, and and really talks about how how neural networks operate, how these monstrous systems actually work, but in a way that you know you can think about in the shower, in a way. So. So okay. that's sort of a current project. Thank you very much, Anurag. I appreciate you explaining what I'm still learning. <laughs> uh, okay. that, that, sound, that sounds amazing. And like when, when I heard about the idea, I said, I, it's not possible that you're, you're, you, you're going to do the lethal treatment to such a topic. But apparently, you are succeeding in doing that. So far, it's looking so far it's looking good, I have to say. But you know, we're not completely there yet. So, sure, I know Dan can be <laughs> a little bit like uh, sophisticated. <laughs> uh, Dan, it's not um, the right word are, to use, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dan, we are um, not seeing. I mean, the it is becoming dark in your in your room, so we are going. Oh, should I turn on the light? I can turn on a light. Maybe you can Thank turn you. the light on. Yes, so yeah, I can yeah, see yeah. you a little better. Yeah, that's uh, that's much better. There you go. Um, um, okay, okay, so I have a couple of other questions lined up. Go for um, it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we are going into like teaching um, topic. Uh, what drove you? Uh, what drove your decision to go with the Socratic method of teaching? And uh, was there a specific learning experience that impacted you in a positive way? Yes. Lisp, first of all. Cond, specifically. And there's this book, I'll, I'll just pull it out of the shelf here, that um, it's called The Little Lisper. I don't know if you can tell how thick something is from the screen. This is how thick it is. 64 pages long. Um, when I was a professor of public policy, um, in 71 through 73, it was my job to teach them how to uh, understand how to program, and I taught them Lisp and Fortran, and also know a little bit about uh, operations research kinds of issues, and a little more things like that. And um, so uh, we had to figure out ways to um, get people to understand. Well, 
some of the students in the class really love the Lisp stuff. So basically, they stayed another week. Uh, it was a it was a summer class because I actually gave the first class at the LBJ school, but it was a summer week and we had a week off. I and they said, "Can can we sort of write a book about this?" I said, "Yeah, let's do it." So I we did it. Um, Mary brought food. Uh, we worked probably till uh, 10 o'clock or 12 o'clock at night, I'm not sure. And in five days, we had written the first Little Lisper. And in fact, if you'll permit me, I'd like to read the names off. I hope it's in here. Um, Arthur Goldberg. Uh, Philip Blackerby, Robert King, David Walrath were involved in that particular week of work. And what I did was I would go from one blackboard to the next in the same room. They were separated by a rather long table and write a question. And then I would go around and I would write the answer and just keep doing that. And one person, they took turns, would write notes, would write what I was writing. And um, the food, I couldn't tell you where it came from. I know that we'd started it out with biblical characters, but decided that was too, gen uh, too non-generic. But everybody in the world eats food. So we decided that would be a, a good a data uh, a good, whatever. Um, and uh, uh, and Khan become, became the obvious metaphor for the question and answers. But I'm not going to take full credit for that because I had a book on PERT, P-E-R-T. Don't even ask me what that stands for anymore. But it was done in a um, programmed, uh, programmed style. But it would always send you to another page and say, OK, you got it wrong. Go to another page. And I thought that was, you know, that's stupid. And then when I realized we were basically doing the left and right hand sides of cons, it became obvious to me that we should be using con as the metaphor for each of the frames. Um, had a few mishaps along the way. When the book first came out, there were frame, there were uh, footnotes. There were only footnotes back then. Um, but when it, ca it came out, the bottoms of the footnotes were at the middle of the page because SRA and I said, we want the cheapest book that the world has ever held in its hands, basically. And it, it, if you wanted to buy it at IU, I think it was like $3.50. Um, but it had an interesting property that they, you know, they had put two, put the top page and the next page on the same page. That would, that's what caused the footnote to be in the middle. Well, we got around that pretty quickly. And it turned out that the success, I'm sorry to use that word, but the success of this book had nothing to do with me. It had to do with the fact that you could open it and it would be a flat book. So when you were sitting at the key punch, which is what they were called, um, you didn't have to worry about it closing on you, which is what all the other books do. Um, anyway, so that's a little bit of the history of, of the Little Lisper. Now, one other little thing I want to tell you about is that um, once I'd gotten to Indiana, no, false. Once I'd gotten, once I arrived to Indiana as a person who was applying for a job, another person was there. His name was Ben Schneiderman. He had already done his interview, and I was about to have my interview the next day, but we were joined at the party. And Ben and I just chatted and chatted, and everybody left us alone. They didn't care that we were just chatting. And um, I think we chatted till around 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. And uh, we talked a little bit about the, the Little Lisper. And it was just, you know, some typed up notes. And I, 
I handed it uh, to him and um, he ended up uh, taking care of the rest of it. <laughs> he named it, he, he went to publishers, he uh, found uh, SRA was very interested in it. I, I don't think he wrote the letters to the people, one of whom was John McCarthy, by the way. Uh, but he did um, basically everything. Next thing I know, I'm uh, quite literally, very next thing I know is I'm holding a contract. I signed the contract and then it arrives. And I was not happy, but turned out it was worked out very well. <laughs> Any other questions at all? I'm sorry if that sounds a little bit too, um, uh, I don't know the right word, uh, but I, I was trying to tell a story. So that's the story. Any uh, other questions? Yeah, I'm got coming. So um, okay. uh, just a, a quick follow up. Um, when is, Sorry, this. Uh, when did? When is the? Uh, when will be the? Uh, sorry, when the, the arrival of the little published? learner? Yes, exactly. You're not asking the right person. <laughs> okay, uh, Anurag. <laughs> Are you still there, Anurag? I'm still here. Yes. Um, uh, soon. Uh, sometime. Sometime by next year. Middle of next year. Yeah, I'd say middle of next year is reasonable. That's my gut feeling too. Um, okay, and that's okay. Uh, that's was a good. Well, we do have a hundred two hundred and seventy three pages of PDF. Okay, which means maybe what twenty pages less. <laughs> so we are moving along. It just it, it, these things take a lot of time. Each, each chapter takes quite a bit of time to make it simple, but that's our goal anyway. Here's the next question. Mm -hmm. um, are intellectual compromises and trade-offs positively necessary in languages for them to be good at solving real world problems effectively, or are we just being soft on ourselves? I want you to repeat it. Yeah, this is interesting. Okay. Yeah, are, intellectual, are, are intellectual compromises and trade-offs positively necessary in languages for them to be good at solving real-world problems effectively, or are we just being soft on ourselves? I think it's, it's referring to something like closure, which is a pragmatic uh, Closure language. is a great language. There's nothing wrong with closure. It's a great language. Yeah, it allows you to do a lot of things. It's got this pragmatic approach, like, uh, and maybe it's... Uh, it's 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 a compromising on like a deep intellectual concepts to be pragmatic. So the, I think the question is asking, um, is that a good thing, or we sh should we like uh, not compromise intellectually on our languages, programming languages? Yeah, I I understand the question a little bit now, but again, my philosophy is. If you are trying to enter the head of your reader, which is all that I try to do, basically, with something deep and interesting, and that's sometimes debatable, but that's what you're trying to do, you have to do it with care. Okay, I know, I know, what he's, I know his question. And I think the same thing may be true of programming. You can, you know, not everybody is going to be a category theorist, no matter what, okay? It's people are not gonna take the time or whatever it happens to be. Um, and then after they write their programs in category theory, there's even a smaller number of people who are gonna be able to deal with it. So you have to find a compromise no matter what. Okay, that's, that's my gut feeling is you have to find a compromise in both the real world programming and the, uh, the more mathematical world of programming. So you're not really being soft on anybody as far as I can tell. I think that, that Clojure has picked a nice compromise 
um, you know, being able to have the maps and stuff is, is really good. Um, but if you're trying to write about them, it's a little harder. That's all I can tell you because for example, well, every language should have modules, but no book requires the modules unless the topic is modules. You know, you can, ima you can imagine writing a little book about modules, but that's a different story. So I don't know if I've answered it to, sa to your satisfaction, but that's as close as I can come. May I say something? Yeah, Mitch? No, Jerry, Mitch, Jerry says something. No, oh, Jerry, hi. Yeah. yeah. I think one thing to realize is the most important thing is that the programs get written. Well, I can't hear you. Say, can you speak up a little? Oh, I'm sorry. Programs <laughs> must be written for people to understand as much as for computers to execute. That's a great that's the, the critical thing is that programming is a, is a mechanism for doing, um, for, for doing communication. Okay. Uh, is that better? Yes. Um, no. Speaking of communication and people, do you, you guys have uh, want to announce something that may be coming out soon? Oh. You mean Jerry? You mean me? Yeah, you mean me, right? Okay. I do. Yeah. Well, yeah. you are Julie. I don't care. Yeah. It's the same. Um, we're, we're one. Uh, <laughs> That's right. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, we've, no, we, uh, Chris Hanson and I have been putting together a book that's ready, pretty much coming out in the spring from MIT Press. We've spent the last many years working on it. And it's a book about very advanced programming technique. Julie, you have any comments? <laughs> um, we have actually a book cover, but I don't know how to show it to you. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but anyway, um, I have I've I've read the book and I think it's fabulous. So yeah, read it, buy it, it, you buy it, whatever. Why don't you put your the yes, cover? No, I was just saying Dan Friedman has written an endorsement for the book, which is on the back cover, actually. Let me get the book. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm happy. I'm very happy. Okay. So, just, anything else? I just else? put a link to the book in chat. Oh, good. <laughs> That's great. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yes, there are a couple of questions. Um, okay. So, these are coming from, uh, like, a, um, like, a before the beginning of the conference, a sent was was a form was sent out. So um, there are two of them. Let me start from the first one. Um, in two thousand eight, a not entirely reliable commentator wrote, "The power that macros provide programmers is widely discussed, yet it is unfortunately still widely misunderstood." In particular, so I, I missed the last two words. It, uh, it's unfortunately widely misunderstood. Yes. In particular, combinations of macros represent the most vast and fertile area of research in programming languages today. That was a few years after you came out with the reasoned schema, running rings along around Prolog. Did your view of schemes, metaprogramming facilities evolve during that project? Was the reason schema generally purely about linking functional and relational programming, or was there also an element of pushing the limits, doing an amazing stunt? <laughs> well, what was the first question? Because I have an answer to that one. So go ahead with the first question. So the, que the first one was, did your view of schemes metaprogramming facilities evolved during that project? The the reason schemer? No, absolutely not. Uh, I've been implementing languages all over the place. All I, the goal of putting those in, and I had a goal, was to enlighten the world about the mag mag magical nature of macros. Now, I didn't have any macro generating macros in there. And you get that also with the, with the simplest model. But no, absolutely not. I, I have been a fan of macros since I picked up the book by Clark Weissman 
which I could probably pull off this shelf, um, but I didn't think that I would have to pull it off. But it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful book on Lisp. Big pages, big print, beautiful, very easy to read. And he described macros at that time the way he did it. But once, as I said, once uh, Eugene figured out this uh, hygiene problem, it was, uh, there was nothing that I wanted ever again. And that was quite a few years ago in uh -huh. terms of macros. Dan, I remember when I started, you were working on a paper and a talk called Object Oriented Style. And your your discussion of macros after after working on well, <laughs> on the macros yes. for that paper after a summer was a little bit different. I think you yes were because it used it. syntax case. Yeah, syntax case is like it's hard for me. I don't like to have moving around useful information be merged with uh, doing arithmetic. I don't like it because in general, I can do better usually. I, Jason Heeman actually showed me an example where I was totally wrong. <laughs> just just to, to be honest, um, I, I said, oh, hmm. I don't know what I can do about that. Uh, that's that's going to be very hard to do. So there's at least one counterexample to my principle that you can always do, do whatever you want with uh, just plain old uh, Hygienic uh, macros. <laughs> um, uh, was it, did you want me to say anything more about macros, Will? Uh, no, I mean, I, I, you just had this, uh, at, at the time you were Oh, I had, upset. I gotten so baffled trying well, to figure out what they were trying well, to do. Well, well, the problem this, was, I think I was you dizzy. thought the, there was something missing, right? So, so syntax rules is this nice, sort of term rewriting, you know, approach. Yeah. And then syntax case has full procedural macros. And and what you wanted was syntax rules with just a little just bit more a power. A twi yes, just a tad yeah. of useful information. And, and that you to my know. knowledge, you've never gotten that. You um, no. You have that to this um, day. So it seems there was like something one missing macro, that you want. Yeah, it's something I wanted. I wanted a, a syntax rules with a just a little bit more stuff in it. And I, I think that's in, in, in Racket though, by now, surely. The syntax parse. I don't, I don't think, no, bad. it's not in Racket. Syntax parse is like a front end for syntax case. So you can do better error messages and things like that. I don't yeah, think yeah, what yeah. you want still exists. It's an open problem that people should work on. It, it would be nice, it would be nice. But it's because, you know, when, uh, when we were doing something called A9, which is this homework assignment that uh, uh, Jeremy Seek and Ron Garcia didn't know was gonna be a homework assignment, <laughs> but they did such a good job of uh, uh, doing the homework assignment that we've been using it ever, some version of it for, for ever since, which was to turn an arbitrary uh, scheme expression into a C program, uh, all with correctness preserving transformations. And um, that was quite a, uh, quite an undertaking as far as I was concerned. And we wanted to teach the students some C, but we didn't want to teach the students some C. We just wanted to get a sense of what it was about. And that worked into a very nice homework assignment. What was the number of passes we had in it? Anybody remember? Will? You remember? Well, first of all, what was the name of the assignment? It had a great A9. Name. No, parenthesis. Oh, parenthesis. Oh, you're the title of the, the handout. Yeah, parenthesis. C, because C, you're going yes. from parenthesis scheme down to C. That, that's and, right. You're right. Yeah, well, you did it different ways, different semesters, but you ended mm -hmm. up, you know, you had to take this interpreter, CPS it. It was a store passing, environment passing interpreter, make it, uh, you know, uh, defunctionalize it, you know, make a representation independent with respect to closures and environments and all that stuff, and then CPS it, and then you ended up going to either register machines or or whatever. Yeah, depends uh, where we were trampolining going. Trampolining or register machines, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. yeah and, and, Wei Shi, uh, are you so, there? So those are all the steps. Yeah. Wei Shi, are you there? Uh, yeah, hi. 
How, how many passes that, that it's, does it take today? I guess 10 or so. About 10? Yeah. Now it's three, it's in three parts now. Um, takes, we, we let them work each part separately instead of all was one homework assignment. I, I'm growing soft in my old age, what can I say? All right, any other questions out there? Yeah, let me let me unmute. Um, so uh, yes, there is another one, and uh, so here it is. Uh, whereas you have been illuminating computer science, uh, computer science for the better part of a century, probing notions that did not figure anywhere in the conscious awareness of the great unwashed masses, now suddenly the thundering herd has noticed functional programming and is whacking it like a piñata to see what candy falls out. Have you noticed interesting effects uh, of the cultural change in the post chemist notion uh, you find in the new students approaching university? Well, I teach, my first time that I teach is in the junior level. Um, Sam Tobin Hochstedt has been teaching the freshman level so by the time they get to me, they already know a lot about higher order functions and all the goodies of racket. And, and we do use racket as our language. It's just the books are always in scheme because we want to make it smaller. Uh, but uh, I haven't noticed a thing. <laughs> in all honesty, I've either been writing books or um, chatting with students when they get to me and and they seem to know an awful lot that's the main thing and i can move a little faster than i usually had to in the past does that answer the question adequately i think so yeah okay um it's a uh, great yeah, question yeah. and beautifully phrased by the way i yes yes i love the I, phrasing I, of it i'm not i'm not doing like a, a great job in reading it out loud but uh, i like i hope you understand that i love the like a pinata <laughs> <laughs> like a pinata was a, a good one um where there, there's the last part of the of uh, the previous question mm -hmm. and was the reason the reason it's schema genuinely purely about linking functional and relational programming or was there an element of pushing the limits and doing an amazing stunt that's a great question that is absolutely a great question i wanted every expression that you could write wherever you wrote it to fit somehow into the logic system that was the primary goal I had in writing it. That's one of the reasons I chose macros because they're very uh, forgiving in that regard. I didn't succeed completely. And over the years, it's actually been whittled down because people feel like, oh, that's too much power to give any human mind. And um, I don't mind that it's whittled down, but the metaphor was, you could put expressions absolutely anywhere. Uh, so if, you know, if you're familiar with one, with run, you should be able to not just put a number in and you, and you don't have, to, and you're not restricted like that. But you can put an arbitrary expression in there. You could say, give me the first four digits of pi. And um, then it would come up with 3.14, whatever. And then and now uh, make sure that you uh, drop uh, any decimals because it has to be an integer. Okay, so it's the number three. Or you could throw a random number. I want a random number of answers. Okay, so it, it, I, I, like, I wanted to keep it as, as flexible as humanly possible. But I saw that too, many people felt that that was too much power. And uh, so it's not that much power anymore. <laughs> I guess it's one way of saying it. Um, but yeah, that's that's my answer to that question. Fantastic. So at this point, I think we arrived at the end of the of the questions that we had queued up. Um, the time is uh, pretty good. We've been like a 20, 
like one hour and 20 minutes in. Um, I, I could offer you to... something that you might like. Yeah, okay. go ahead. You can say no, and I'm happy to, to listen to that. I would like for Weishi to show you how we go from knowing virtually nothing to producing the um, uh, Ackermann's function. I use it in my first lecture in 311. And by the time it's over, I can't say it's today's reality, but by the time it's over, there are a lot of jaws on the floor because it's extraordinary that you can take something that's was famous in the night early night was known in the early 19 uh, early 1930s late 19 1929 and blow people's minds with it and have them believe it really is important to understand how to think about functional programming languages it may take what about 15 minutes or so uh Weishi? Uh, or five. Or five? You can do five. Oh yeah, but, I mean, fantastic! I'm looking forward I love, to it. I love. I love for him to show you this. We do it every semester. It's. Yeah, it, let's it, put it, it on it video. Always, <laughs> what's that? Let's put it on video. <laughs> well, if we do it now, it'll be on video. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Uh, do we? Uh, do you? Do you need to share the screen? What do you need uh, to do? Can give me the access. Uh, I'll, I'll also mention that I've put a number of links in chat, including to the parentheses exercise, if you want to read that. Uh, you're saying that other people watching should go to the place where we hide parentheses? That's fine. <laughs> I don't have any problems. With, no. <laughs> I, I don't I'm have any problems that with that, Will. I just wanted to know if that's what you were saying. <laughs> Yeah, there, there are links on chat to, you know, Jerry's new book and all that stuff. So anyway. Yeah, that's, okay. that's so good. I'm going to collect all of them. They're having like both chats, one here, one on Discord. And I want to make sure that all the links that were mentioned are in a yeah. place where they are attached to, to, the, to the talk. It, so I'm trying to understand how to give um, uh, Wishy uh, um, uh, sharing capabilities if it doesn't. All right, let's derive the Ackerman Pater function. Um, so this is uh, what Dan hands out to every C311 student, every semester as a welcome gift. And so let's do this uh, in a sibling language bracket. Uh, we start by defining plus. Plus is a function about two numbers and we're gonna write this function recursively. That means First off, we will have a base case that tests if something reaches zero. And in this case, if the second number is zero, the result is n, the first number. Else, now we're in the recursive case. In the recursive case, the first thing to do is to write down the natural recursion. And then call this natural recursion uh, because you keep everything unchanged except for the thing that you are testing for the base case. That is, we sub one from M and keep everything else that are, uh, that is N unchanged. And this is the result of natural recursion. And now we just have, have to figure out, well, how do we get to the actual result? So we do that by adding one to the natural recursion. All right, uh, with plus defined, we can go ahead and look at multiplication. It's uh, to a function about two numbers. And we are doing this in a same fashion. So I can copy a big block of my previous code. I only need to uh, change the result for the base case and the wrapper that wraps around my natural recursion. For the base case, uh, when the second number is zero, obviously uh, that's gonna be zero. And for the recursion case, what I need is uh, this adding n that wraps around my natural recursion. Okay, just following this pattern, we can easily come up with the next function, uh, exponentiation. 
So first I have the base case and the natural recursion. For the base case, the result is going to be one. Anything to the zeros is one. And uh, now we have the natural recursion. We need to uh, multiply it by n to get our result. Let's give it a whirl. Um, so 2 to the fifth, 32, uh, 3 to the fifth. OK, that looks good. OK, what's coming next? Uh, well, if we just keep going, you know, following this path, we can just come up with another uh, function, maybe an arrow with two legs, even if we don't know what it's going to do. So we change the natural recursion and we change the, the wrapper. Okay, and then we can run it. So say it's uh, upper arrow. Uh, Uh, two to the three. It's some number and we don't know exactly what it is, but we know it grows pretty fast because it's not returning at this moment. And we are on the right track to the Ackerman Peter function, which grows pretty fast. Okay. And next, uh, now Stan's turn to ask this question. Well, what if we want a function, uh, we want an arrow with a hundred legs? One way we can do that is to write 99 other functions. Uh, an arrow with three legs, then we use it to build an arrow with four legs. That's one way. And the programmers know better, which is write a program to generate such programs. So we can define a program generator, which we call a G for generating. What it does is to take in an index. If the index is zero, then we will have our first function. If second, uh, if it's one, then we will have our second function, and so on and so forth. So if we have uh, this lambda i here, and if this i is zero, we can just uh, let g spit out this plus. Okay, that looks fine. Uh, but you know, once we have this G here, there's no need to keep all the previous definitions because we know this plus here is just G of zero. Okay, so uh, how about G of one? If I is one, then it's gonna give us the uh, multiplication function which is this one. And we got some renamings to do, uh, like multiplication g of one plus is g of zero. And indent my code. Uh, okay. And for everything else, if you look at uh, one leg arrow and the two leg arrow, they are almost identical. So we can just put it here and change the name. The recursive part is G of I. And the wrapper is G of sub one of I. Okay. Okay, run it. Uh, say G of one uh, is multiplication three times five, 15. Uh, three to the fifth. And uh, this one, we are not gonna get its result for a well. And as the I getting larger and larger, we are getting closer, closer to a uh, terminating, but um, growing pretty slow, uh, Ackerman-Peter function. So uh, here it is. And by the way, there are other correctness preserving transformations, correctness preserving transformations that will allow you to turn this directly into the standard three line Ackerman function. And we leave that, I think, today for an exercise 
for the brave. And um, besides, I want to have I want to have a homework assignment I can give. <laughs> anyway, um, it's, I've enjoyed this very much, and I appreciate uh, everyone who's come. And I just hope you have a a, a great uh, weekend and enjoy yourselves and relax. And um, it's been a lot of fun. I thank you very much, uh, Renzo, for the invitation. Uh, if I was a little bit too forward, I'm, I'm, I apologize, but I, I, get, I get extremely excited when I'm talking about my stuff. <laughs> so. I, 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 it was a please, pleasure to have please, you, uh, Dan. Forgive me. Uh, pleasure all, uh, pleasure completely, to our, completely our pleasure to have you, Dan, and that, uh, every, uh, everyone else tonight in this conversation. It was a lot of fun. I, I got to read uh, a few of your uh, papers and part of your books in preparation for this and it was this was like uh, my gift for the conference y your gift to me for the conference so thank you very much and um so just a couple of uh, additional word uh, let me just spotlight on me um so the the conference is not finished for like uh, who is still in the in the zoom meeting and uh, um in on youtube um uh, this is the first half tomorrow we are going to have the second day we're going to start at 8.30 uh, GMT in the morning, uh, like to have uh, like a different time zone for like different parts of the world. So hopefully we're helping with that. And uh, there's going to be another eight talks and another keynote. So feel free to join us again tomorrow. We're refreshed, have a, have a shower, have a dinner, have a, uh, a nice end of the day, wherever you are. Thank you very much, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Really great. Thanks. Great conference. Thanks, Thank you. Nice Thank to you. see you guys. Thank you. Bye bye.